Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Panayotis Yoryu. I'm currently a fellow at the Imperial College of the Department of Bioengineering. And uh, today I will talk about the MemRistor, which is the focus of my research. I'm focusing on theoretical aspects of MemRistors and also on modeling uh, device of MemRistors. So the MemRistor is a new fundamental circuit element, which uh, uh, although it was proposed in the 70s, it was only very recently discovered uh, by HP. Uh, the reason why it took us so long to discover the MemRistor is because the phenomena which give rise to MemRistors appear on the nanoscale. And the reason why the MemRistor is so interesting is because there are many potential applications for MemRistors. I have divided my presentation into three sections. I will, I will begin first with a short tutorial about the MemRistor as, a, as a, an ideal circuit element. Then I will go through some practical memristive devices. And finally, I will discuss some of the applications of, of memristors. So in classical circuit theory, we have four fundamental circuit variables. We have the current, the voltage, the charge, and the flux linkage. If you see, uh, by looking at the diagram, you can see that we can combine these uh, four variables in six pairwise relations. Five of these uh, relations are well known, and some of you may be familiar with them. The first two pairs define the voltage and the current. So the voltage is defined as the rate of change of flux linkage, and the current is defined as the rate of change, uh, as the rate of, change of charge. The other three pairs define the fundamental circuit variables. We have the resistor, which, uh, which uh, relates the voltage with the current, the capacitor, which relates the voltage with the charge, and also we have the inductor, which relates the current with the flux linkage. These are the three fundamental circuit elements, and, the, the, and, they, are, and they are also passive elements. The resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. They are passive because they, don't re, they do not require an internal power source to operate, and they are also fundamental because we cannot reproduce their, be, their behavior with other fundamental passive circuit elements. You may have noticed from the diagram that an, an element is missing in order to fill this, uh, to complete the symmetry. Leon Chua in 1971 realized that out of the six possible pairwise combinations, only five had been identified. So he proposed the memristor as the element relating the charge and, and the flux in order to fill the missing link. Although it was proposed in, the, in 1971, the memristor re remained unobserved for several decades. It was only very recently, in 2008, that it, uh, the first memristive device was uh, identified in HP labs. This happened while researchers at HP were experimenting for building molecular scale electronics. And uh, when they were doing uh, the, their experiments, they observed these peculiar current voltage responses, which they managed to explain using a memristor model. After the accidental rediscovery of the memristor, uh, essentially the field of memristors uh, was revived again. Memristive uh, devices have many attractive properties, such as nanoscale dimensions, low power consumption, and non volatile memory. This makes them suitable for many applications such as computer memories, programmable circuits, and neuromorphic circuits. Uh, because of these uh, uh, nice properties for memristors, they, uh, they have attracted the attention of many leading companies in technology, in the technology sector. For example, H a cooperation between HP and Hynix is planning to release commercial-based memristors by the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Also, IBM is uh, experimenting with phase change memories, and, and they're also working on the Synapse project, which is aiming to build neuromorphic circuits uh, using uh, mem memristive devices. 
Also, the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductor is suggesting that these devices may be uh, candidates for replacing the, the current memory technologies, which has, are, are soon reaching the end of their life. So uh, the name memristor is a combination of two works. It's, uh, it's a memory and a resistor. So as its name indicates, the memristor behaves similarly to a nonlinear resistor in the sense that it opposes the, the flow of charge in the same way as a resistor does. Uh, the resistance of the memristor is, is called memristance and it has the same units as, uh, as the resistor, which is ohms. The difference is that the memristor has non-volatile memory. So its resistance value changes permanently depending of, on how much charge has flown through the device. As long as we keep applying the input signal across the memristor, the device keeps changing its memristance. Once the input signal is removed, the memristor will maintain its memristance indefinitely or until we apply the input signal again. If we want to reverse the, the memristance of the device, then we have to apply an appropriate input uh, for an appropriate duration of time of the opposite polarity. Here, here uh, I have included a comparison between the resistor and the memristor. Linear resistors are, are described by Ohm's law, which, is, uh, as, which essentially says that the voltage, uh, the output voltage of the device is equal to the, uh, to the resistance multiplied by the input current. In this case, the resistance is constant. Uh, so, for example, if we double the input uh, signal uh, for a constant resistance, then we will double the output as well. In the case of a memristor, memristors are also described by Ohm's law. However, in this case, the memristance is variable. Uh, actually, the memristance is a function of the charge or the flux linkage. I have included here an example uh, where you can see how a variable memristance looks like. So the, the function in the square brackets is, describes the memristance. As I have mentioned in a previous slide, because the, uh, the rate of change of charge is equal to the current. So this is equivalent to saying that uh, the charge is equal to the entire past history of the input current. If we use this idea inside Ohm's law and we substitute the charge with this integral here, we can see that the memristance depends on the entire past history of the input current. So in other words, the memristor has memory. Memristors can be combined in series and parallel networks in the same way that resistors can. As, uh, and actually they follow the same rules when we want to evaluate the total memristance of the network. For example, in a series network of memristors, if we want to evaluate the total memristance, it is equal to the sum of the individual memristances. And, and, and as you can see here, this is exactly the same as for resistors. But in this case, the total memristance is a function of the charge. And similar rules apply for parallel networks as well. Here you can see the response of a memristor to a sinusoidal input signal. The response is always limited to the first and, uh, and third quadrant, which indicates that the device is passive. So it means that it does not require an internal power source to operate. Also, the memristance is always bounded between a minimum and a maximum resistance value, which we refer to as R on and R off. Also, the response is always crosses the origin, which means that once the input signal is removed, is removed from this device, then the output is always forced to zero. Also, as the frequency of the input increases, the memristor degenerates to a linear resistor and, eventu and, and eventually it becomes a linear resistor. So in practice, the, the resistor is, is the limit of the memristor at high frequencies. So uh, let's see now how we can use a, a, an ideal memristor as a single memory cell to store four binary values. The first question that we need to answer is how, how can we map the four binary values on the memristor? To do this, we have to select four discrete resistance state and associate each one of them with, uh, with one of the binary values. For example, here I have associated the value 
zero zero with the resistance R R zero zero, and uh, the binary value zero one with the resistance R zero zero one, and so on. So the the next question is how we can write one of these four binary values onto the memory store cell. Let's assume initially that the the, the memory cell is at its mi uh, minimum resistance state R on. And also that we want to write the value 3, which is mapped on the resistance R10. So to do this, we have to drive the device in such a way so that we switch it from its uh, R on state to the resistance R10. This is equivalent to saying that an amount of charge delta Q has to flow through the device. So in order to write this value, we have to apply an input signal which of, of, of appropriate polarity such that uh, the, the, uh, the device switches from R1 to R10. So the next question is uh, how can we uh, read the stored value from, the, from this device? In theory, applying any signal on an ideal memory store will affect uh, its state. However, in practice, most practical uh, devices have a threshold. This means that if we drive the device below this threshold, then we do, we, we do not affect its state. So in order to read safely uh, the value stored on the device, we have to apply an input signal, which uh, is always below this predefined threshold value. So this brings me to the next part of the presentation in which I will present some practical memoristive devices. As you can see from the picture, uh, Membristors are nanoscale devices. Unlike the conventional uh, resistor, capacitor, and inductor, it is quite unlikely that we'll have large scale memristors. Also, you can see from the picture that the example here is approximately 60 nanometers thick. To understand how small this is, uh, just imagine that 1.5 nanometers is equivalent to two silicon atoms. There are many physical mechanisms which give rise to memoristic behavior. They usually go under the term resistance switching devices or mechanisms. I will, I will describe some indicative examples in the, in the next few slides. <coughs> the important thing to remember from these uh, mechanisms is that uh, all of them share some common char characteristics. All of these devices are two terminal devices and they are nanoscale. The nanoscale dimensions are very important because uh, when an input signal is applied across these devices, very strong electric fields develop which cause various phenomena which have as a result the change in the resistance of the device. Also, the resistance change in all of these devices is electrically induced. This means that the input and output of the device is always current or voltage. Finally, the resistance change is non-volatile. So when, th when the input signal is removed from these devices, they maintain their state for some time. HP provided a simple model in order to describe their first memoristive devices. Although the, although the model is very simplified, it captures the main characteristics of memoristors. The actual device consists of a titanium dioxide layer between two platinum electrodes. The oxide layer is divided into two regions, a doped low resistivity region and an undoped high resistivity region. The total resistance of the device is modeled by two variable resistors in series, whose ratio depends on the width of the doped region. When an input signal is applied across the device, the oxygen vacancies move uh, inside the device, effectively changing the total uh, memory distance of the, of the device. is what's storing the information? No. So uh, basically when, when the oxygen vacancies move, the width of the width here changes. And uh, so, so this resistor here becomes uh, larger and this one becomes smaller. So the total resistor becomes smaller. Okay, so it's just the valencies that are Sorry? changing. Okay. So ba basically imagine that you have two variable resistors. One has a low resistance and one has a high resistance. And uh, this boundary here controls uh, how large is each one of these two resistors. And as, uh, when this boundary, sorry, 
when this boundary here grows towards the undoped region, it means that the low resistance resistor is larger. So the, the total resistance becomes smaller. So the first example of device that I will describe are the redox based devices. These are devices in which the memristor loses or gain, gains charge carriers through reduction and oxidization. According to the International Technology Roadmap, these are one of the most promising technologies that they may replace the, uh, the currently used technologies for memory devices. The actual device consists of a metal insulator metal structure, which is similar to the picture they have shown for the HP model. And when an input signal is applied across these devices, three types of structural changes affect the conductivity of the device. One possibility is for a single filament to grow, another possibility is for multiple filaments to grow, and another possibility is for a uniform from to develop. The uniform from is actually the picture that I have shown for the HP model. So these stru structural changes are a result of various phenomena such as electrochemical metallization, valence change and thermochemical mechanisms. Here you can see how a single filament looks like. These filaments are essentially high conductivity paths through, through which uh, charge carriers can easily flow. Uh, their di diameter is usually 1 to 2 nanometers, which indicates the scalability of these devices. Also, in a device with multiple filaments, uh, a larger number of filaments mean lower resistance. Here you can see how a uniform front looks like. The darker region in the picture indicates the, the low resistance uh, due to, due to top doping. When an input signal is applied on the device, the low resistance region grows uniformly towards the negative electrode. And this has as a result the total, the total resistance of the device to uh, decrease. This is exactly the picture that the HP model describes. Another example are phase change memories. Uh, these devices have a similar structure uh, to the redox devices. But uh, when an input signal is applied across the device, the resistive material uh, is, is heated, and this causes the, the material to change phase between an amorphous, which is of, of high resistance, to a crystal, which is of low resistance. In, uh, it is also possible by uh, properly controlling the input signal to, to maintain these devices at an intermediate state, a polycrystalline state, which is a mixture of both phases. And uh, this indicates the potential of these devices to be used for multi-bit storage, so storing more than one bit per memory cell. According to the International Technology Roadmap, these are prototypical devices which are for which we have uh, working prototypes. Another example of a memoristic mechanism is electromigration. In this case, the resistance ch change happens due to, due to changes in the geometry of the device. The device is actually a, a very simple, it's a, only a nanowire. So when an input signal is applied across these devices, ions move within the nanowire uh, because of the electrostatic for forces or because of collisions with other charge carriers. Due to the ion migration, the shape of the nanowire changes. You can see the initial state here and after the inputs are applied. And this has as a result for the total resistance of the device to change. This is a very extremely slow process, so it is quite unlikely that we will see it in future memory devices. The final example which I have included for devices is uh, spintronic devices. In these devices, the flow of current is, contro is controlled depending on the spin of the electrons. The device consists of a ferromagnet and a semiconductor. Uh, the, ferromagnet, uh, the ferromagnet accepts electrons of only of, of one spin, and uh, so the electrons of the opposite spin are not allowed to go through and accumulate in the semiconductor, forming a cloud. This cloud in the semiconductor opposes the flow of charge uh, of electrons, and as the size of the cloud increases, the opposition becomes larger, and at a critical value, no current can flow through the device. 
in this table here compares uh, the new technologies with current technologies, uh, with current memory technologies. It div the technologies are divided in baseline, prototypical, and emerging technologies. Baseline technologies are essentially the memory technologies which we currently use for memories. Prototypical are technologies for, for which we have working prototypes. And emerging technologies are technologies for which uh, uh, we, we are still at the research stage. The table here compares the current and projected performance uh, of these technologies in, in various aspects, such as feature size, cell area, read time, write erase time, retention time, write cycles, write voltage, read voltage, and write energy. I have used three different columns to indicate with green the first best performance, with uh, yellow the second best performance, and with red the third best performance. You can see here that redox-based devices and also phase change devices and in some extent spintronic devices here uh, are projected to be uh, at least as good as current technologies uh, or possibly better. This table here compares the, the future prospects of new technologies, but in different aspects than the previous table. Here, the technologies are classified according to their scalability, their potential for building multi-level cells, 3D integration, fabric fabrication cost, and also endurance. You can see here that, again, redox-based devices and phase change memories, and in some extent, spintronic devices, uh, are again the winners among the new technologies. The most commonly used architecture for building uh, arrays of memory stores is the nano crossbar architecture. In this architecture, the memory store array consists of two parallel layers of nano wires which are pr placed perpendicular to each other. At the cross point, uh, at the, at the point of intersection of these nanowires, we, the, an appropriate material is placed, which is acting as the, as the memory store. The two electrodes at, at each cross point can be used to individually address and configure these memory stores. Here you can see the schematic and also pictures from a microscope of a one kilobit crossbar array. These, the, the actual array consists of a top silver layer a middle layer of amorphous silicon and the bottom layer of polysilicon. The important feature of this uh, array is that it is compatible with the CMOS fabrication process. This, uh, this is a very important feature for, for, uh, for these devices because it means that uh, fabrication labs do not have to upgrade their existing production lines in order to fabricate these devices. So it, it, in the end, it reduces the cost of fabricating fabricate them. As I have said in the first part of my presentation, memory stores are passive devices. This means that they cannot provide energy any subsequent parts of the circuit. So uh, in order to make them more useful, a uh, possible solution is to combine them with layers of active, active components, in other words, transi transistors. In this way, we benefit from both worlds. On the one hand, we have the functional flexibility of transistors, and on the other hand, we have the high intensity, low power, and non-volatile memory of memory stores. Uh, there are several examples of redox based devices and phase change devices which can be integrated with the CMOS technology. Depending on how we divide the functionality between the two layers, we end up with different variations of the hybrid CMOS memory store architecture. Uh, but all of them are based on the same principle. We have two layers the top layer with memory stores, and the bottom layer with CMOS transistors. For example, in the C CMOL architecture, uh, memory stores participate also in the logic computation. So you can see that in the bottom CMOS layer, we, have, we need only one type of gates, and the number of gates is more, it's more dense. On the, on the second example, the FPNI architecture, uh, memory stores participate only in the rewiring of the, of the CMOS gates. So uh, in order to implement the logic, we need a larger vari variety of gates. But uh, this results to uh, a smaller number of gates on the CMOS layer. Because the CMOS uh, technologies 
quickly reaching its physical limits. Uh, scientists are, are looking for alternative ways in order to extend its lifetime without requiring any further shrinking of the transistors. The hybrid architecture, which I have shown in the previous slide, may be a possible solution for extending the lifetime of, C of the CMOS process without requiring any further shrinking of the transistors. The idea here is that we transfer some of the functionality from the CMOS layer in, in a memristive layer in order to take advantage of these nanoscale devices. And also, we can stack several of, the, of these devices on top of each other in a 3D architecture. And also, it, uh, it is possible to build multi-level cells, so store more than one bit per cell. In the final part of my presentation, we'll discuss about some of the applications of memory stores. I have divided the applications in digital and analog. Uh, the division is, is based on, on whether and on how the, the memory stance of the device is utilized. In digital application, in, in digital applications, only uh, only a, dis a discrete number of resistance state is used. On the other hand, in analog applications, we use a, the complete resistance change between a minimum and a maximum values. All the digital applications are based on the same principle. We have a, a, mem a memory store cell, which can be configured to two or more discrete resistance states. Each resistance state is used to represent a binary value. So the most obvious applications is to build, uh, build bistable or multi-stable memory cells. In this way, by using memory stores as memory cells, we utilize their small dimensions and non-volatility in order to build high density and low power uh, memories. Another potential application is for digital computation. Uh, we can use a, a, an array of memory stores in order to, to implement Boolean logic. Because memory stores are, are passive elements, we, we need to implement fundamentally different computational paradigms in order to implement Boolean logic. Some of these approach, approaches are wire end logic, threshold logic, and implication logic. The best approach is, is implication logic, uh, which uses the implication operator, because it's, it's the only one which is computationally complete. This means that uh, the implication operator is able to implement all the Boolean functions. The final digital application which I have included is configurable uh, FPGA-like circuits. Field programmable gate arrays are essentially circuits which co consist of general purpose, uh, logic and memory blocks, which, uh, which are connected through rec reconfigurable wiring with each other. We can use these circuits to implement any kind of Boolean function, and they are, uh, which is limited only by the number of gates which exist on the, on the chip. The idea here is to uh, exploit the, the, the advantages of memory stores by transferring some of the functionality into a memoristic layer. For example, we can implement the memory blocks, the logic blocks, or the lookup tables which implement the, the digital functions, and also the circuitry which uh, implements the rewiring of the logic blocks. The, the digital applications of memory stores uh, mostly use the, the properties of memory stores in order to improve, uh, improve on existing applications. Uh, how, however, uh, in, anal in analog applications, memory stores can be, can be used to enable uh, new, more unconventional applications. One of the most interesting applications is neuromorphic circuits. These circuits are artificial neural networks which are implemented in how hardware and they are used to emulate some of the functionality of the human or animal's brain. Here we, we exploit the fact that memory stores behave very similarly to the biological synapse. The synapse in our brain is what implements the learning. So a, lim a synapse determines how strong is a connection between two neurons and whether one neuron will, f uh, will propagate a signal towards another neuron. Depending on how frequently, how strongly one neuron fires towards another neuron, uh, the synapse adjusts its weight at, and by, and by, 
by calcul th through through a nonlinear function, which takes into, into account the past history of the input signal. This 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 behavior is very similar to the resistance, which which uh, adjusts its memory stance depending on the entire past history of the input signal. Our brain has uh, thousands of, of synapses per neuron, and also it has uh, uh, millions of neurons per square centimeter. The current CMOS technology uh, cannot reach this high density of, uh, of neurons per, of synapse per neuron because of power and space limitations. So this, the suggested alternative here, uh, here is to implement the neurons using CMOS transistors, which are, which are relatively uh, sparser in such circuits, and, and use the nanoscale memristors to implement the synapse for which we, re we require higher densities. An example for, uh, for which this has already been used, but in simulations, is to emulate the V1 cortex of the human brain, which is part of our visual system. Other potential analog applications of memristors are chaotic circuits, uh, wh where memristors can be used to trigger chaotic oscillations, cellular neural networks, where they can be used as the programmable uh, template weights, and configurable analog circuits, where, where they can be used as programmable uh, resistors. In such circuits, essentially by adjusting the value of the memristor, we are adjusting uh, some, some feature of the circuit, such as oscillation frequency, gain, and threshold. A final application which I, I have included is uh, uh, how we can use a memristor grid to solve a maze puzzle. The first step is to map the grid, the, the maze, onto the grid of memristors. Now, uh, when, when the maze intersects the grid of memristors at some point, we assume that these memristors are, are disconnected from the grid. Uh, we assume initially that all the resistors, uh, all the memristors in the grid are at their high resistance state. In order to find the solution of the maze, we apply an input signal across the entrance of the maze and, uh, and the exit, exit of the maze. After some time, the solution of the maze will be the, the path in which the, the memristors have switched to their low resistance state. If, there, if the maze has multiple solutions, we have to apply the signal longer and then the multiple paths will, will appear as well. The shorter path will be the one with the lowest resistance. This concludes my presentation in which I, uh, I have discussed the memristor, a new fundamental circuit element which brings under the same umbrella all resistance switching memory devices. A big challenge in the field of memristors still remains the development of a of a, a circuit theory for analyzing memristors, and this is actually one of the focus of my research. Uh, and by developing such a theory, we, we may be able to use a uniform framework to design and predict how these resistive, uh, me these resistive memory devices can work and be designed. Also, by understanding these devices better, we may be able to, to suggest more radical applications for memristors. Uh, what has certainly happened with the discovery of ovary of the memristor is that the memristor has, has taught us that the fundamental circuit elements are not limited to the resistor, inductor, and capacitor. Actually, not only there is a fourth fundamental circuit element, but Leon Chua went as far as proposing that there is an infinite amount of circuit elements. Two of these circuit elements are the mem capacitor and the mem inductor. Imagine, imagine if we have at our disposal Memory, uh, memory, uh, configurable capacitors, configurable inductors, and configurable resistors. How, how flexible and versatile circuits we would be able to build. We may be able to build a, a full configurable analog circuit. Although MEM capacitors and, and MEM inductors can, have not been identified in the lab with certainty, we have seen several examples of memristive devices. Uh, also, we have seen that some of these devices are able to compete with current technologies, and maybe they're able to uh, overcome, overcome them in per, per performance. It is, import, it is important for the, for the progress of the, of the field for some of these uh, technologies to become standardized. This will provide with, uh, scientists with uh, 
with some standard technology to experiment with. And it's also at the best interest of the industry, which is always looking for alternative ways for improving the performance of uh, their products. Thank you for your attention. I would like also to thank Karin and uh, Dashant for organizing this presentation. If you have any questions, I will be happy to, to answer. the stability of the devices into external things like temperature and static electric fields of varying natures. Um, how stable are we talking about as a device? Uh, if we're talking about experimental devices, then they're not very stable. Uh, but uh, there are devices that are quite stable. Uh, they can maintain their state for quite a long time. In varying temperatures? Uh, yeah. Maybe up to, let's say, 80 degrees uh, Celsius. Yeah? When you're using them um, to store binary values, um, what, uh, what, how, how many discrete, discrete resistances can be read off a device currently? And I presume there's, there's some sort of practical limit there, right? Uh, so the limit is how uh, reliably we can, you, you can distinguish one state from another. So how many states can be so, distinguished? I think for now we are, we are only able to store two, uh, one, one, uh, basically one value, one bit per cell. Sure. But uh, w uh, we believe that there's capability of storing more bits per cell. But reliably only two at the moment. This is related to the first question. Mm -hmm. If you keep temperature at the you know decent temperature and there's no interference, is there drift in these devices? Meaning you write and will it move its state even if there are no changes in the environment at all, or or there's no change in the resistance once you stop applying that voltage or there that current? Um, the, the, there is a drift in the device. It, it, I, so I think the correct question is to ask is what is the application that they use the memory for? If you want it to as a computer memory, then you need a device that is stable for a very long time. But for example, in neuromorphic circuits, you need devices that are, are, are stable for shorter times because we also we want to implement learning, but also forgetting. So it's actually in our benefit for the device to uh, lose its memory in some applications. And uh, there are examples of both extremes. Forgetting rate be um, uh, configured, just like you know, the learning rate could be configured. Yes, it, it can. So there are examples of devices where you can control the the forgetting rate depending on the size of the device. So you change slightly the size of the device, and then the forgetting rate changes slightly as well. Yep. And related to that, can you can you um, dictate to which position it will decay back to? So, as it were, you could store, uh, as it were, prior in the uh, sort of zero positions, if you see what I mean, and then uh, you would update it. And it would, could you could you configure it so that it would de each um, uh, e each element would decay back to a, a predetermined value? So it will decay to its lowest resistance. Right. So, yeah. so you can't. No, you can't uh, change so it. you fabricate a device that you know that it has this low resistance, and that's the, where it will stop decaying. Mm. Right, let's thank Panayotis again.